All right, welcome everybody. The first of our spring series, my name is Benji Cohn, here with the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series webinars. And a good friend of mine, Scott, is joining us. He's our area fisheries managers down in the Hutchinson office and a father to two awesome little girls and an avid turkey hunter too. So he's gonna come and talk to us about turkey hunting today. So this is episode 154, again, the first one of our spring series. So I hope everybody enjoys the program today. And with that, Scott, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we'll get started. Awesome, thank you, Benji. Uh, like Benji said, I work for Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, but my wildlife colleagues would tell you that I'm a fish squeezer. I'm on the uh, fisheries side of the coin. Uh, but today I'm uh, uniquely equipped perhaps to talk to you about turkey hunting with youth. And I wanna share with you today a little bit about how you might go about it, uh, getting a young person involved in hunting, specifically starting with turkeys, and some of the tips and tricks. There's some things that I have learned the hard way, and there's some things that some very experienced turkey hunters uh, have passed on to me. So we'll uh, kick things off here and kind of run, run through a number of topics. Um, <clears throat> specifically, we're going to talk about how Minnesota spring youth season sets up talk about exposing uh, kids to turkey hunting, how you might go about doing that in preparation for actual hunting experiences. As you might imagine, we're gonna spend some time talking about firearm safety and gun training. And uh, we will cover where you might hunt with some uh, advice for that. Um, talk a little bit about letting kids be part of or leading the process of both hunting and all the preparation that goes uh, into turkey hunting that really can be a year round thing. And talk a little bit about sleep training, uh, unique to youth turkey hunting, and talk about what's in the bag that we're bringing out there, the specialized gear we'll use on youth hunts, and then just some tips that sort of set the table for your turkey hunting season with a young person. Bottom line, hey, we need to enjoy this. These are the good old days. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. So uh, the structure of Minnesota's youth spring turkey season, uh, there's no minimum age. And basically uh, the reason for that, we'll get into that in just a little bit, but um, the state of Minnesota doesn't tell you at what point uh, you, know, you should be starting your kid or, or setting that threshold. Uh, all the time periods are open. So uh, the season kicks off this year in 2024 on April 17th. And those of you that are familiar with turkey seasons know they run for approximately one week and then the final season is, is two weeks. Uh, so all the time periods are open and you can get a kid out there whenever it works for you. Um, importantly, you should uh, get a youth license. And if it's your first time doing this, you want to kind of take your time going through it. Uh, it's a reduced price for ages 13 to 17, and it's free for kids that are under the age of 13. Uh, one of the other beauties of the youth season, statewide hunting opportunities. You can hunt all across Minnesota's turkey range with the exception of a few permit draw areas. Uh, places like Whitewater, um, I'm trying to think as Carlos Avery might be included as well. There's a couple of places that are on a limited draw. Make sure you check out uh, the links for uh, the turkey seasons and where those limited draw locations are. I want to talk a bit about exposure to turkey hunting. Uh, this is really, you have to walk uh, before you can run. You have to crawl before you can walk. And if we're taking kids out into the turkey woods, we're just not throwing them out there to start hunting, right? Uh, it really begins with some exposure. And you really have to look for those opportunities. Um, I would make the argument, at least what I did with my kids, was they were coming along uh, a couple of times within each season over a couple of seasons and that gave them exposure to what we experience in the in the turkey woods and you know those are exhilarating fun places to be where you get to see some amazing things that the average person doesn't get to see so bring them along get them exposed to it so they kind of have an idea of what to expect before they're going to launch into their own hunts and if you're looking for those opportunities how am i going to do that well let's Say, you know, if you're hunting this year and you think in a few years your kid might be ready, um, hey, if you've already filled the tag, the monkey's off your back. You can still get out to the turkey woods, bring that kid along. Um, if you didn't fill a tag and you're waiting for season F to come along, for those unfamiliar in Minnesota, um, if you are unsuccessful in 
your season A, B, C, D, uh, or E, you can turn around and hunt the F period at the very end of the year using an unfilled tag from earlier in the season. Um, so if you're waiting for that season F to come along because you have an unfilled tag or you've already filled a tag, what a great opportunity in the interim to take a kid out. Um, it's going to give you the benefit of knowing what's happening out in the woods, and it's just going to give that kid some exposure. You know, you can't bring a firearm along with you, but you can uh, you can scout things out. And it's just, again, it's a great opportunity to spend more time in the turkey woods, which those of us that are diehard uh, turkey hunters love to do. Here's the big one. So we mentioned uh, in the previous slide talking about how the state youth turkey season is structured, that there's not a minimum age. This is where, as a parent or guardian, you really have to gauge your child's readiness and their maturity level. Every kid is different, diff is uh, different, and I've seen this firsthand. You know, I've seen kids that are pre-kindergarten that are ready to get out there and hunt, and I've seen teenagers that I just would not trust to <laughs> spend time or or sit through a turkey hunting session. So every kid's going to be a little bit different. Uh, thus, why they don't put an age re restriction on it. One of the big ones that you're going to deal with as a parent or guardian bringing a young kid into turkey hunting is that planning and preparation process and the understanding that uh, we're looking to make a kill. We're going, we want to be able to harvest a bird. And there's a lot of deep discussions that you're going to get at, um, philosophical discussions, potentially religious discussions about uh, how you choose to eat, what your diet makeup is going to be, and what is the role of a hunter and what we do as hunters, the sustainable um, system of harvest that we have, uh, how we make these experiences in the outdoors. And when we do harvest, when we are, uh, when we do make a kill, we, we, if it's deer, if it's ducks, if it's turkeys, what that means. Um, you know, I've talked about with my kids trying to be respectful and uh, of, of the kill and of the animal and also to uh, be thinking about the choices that we make. Uh, who's doing the killing ultimately if you're a meat eater? Is, is it going to be you uh, harvesting wild game or are you going to go to the grocery store and buy your meat and have someone else do the killing? Uh, ultimately, I would say turkeys these days are the modern gateway hunt for most kids. Um, I think one or two generations ago, it probably started off with small game hunting. You might have uh, chased after some rabbits or some squirrels. But in today's day and age, it really starts with turkey hunting. It seems to be the gateway to a lot of other hunting opportunities. So embrace it. There are not other competitions in the spring, right? You don't have all the multitude of different hunting seasons going on like you do in the fall. Uh, really, that, that only focus is turkey. So kind of embrace it and use this as a, as a way to get your kids into the outdoors and into hunting. Like you would imagine, my, my focus in this talk uh, with you is to talk about uh, getting kids out <clears throat> with the idea that they would be hunting with firearms. You, you certainly can bring a kid out with a bow or a crossbow uh, to, do the arch, to do the archery thing, uh, but for most folks, uh, a firearm is probably going to be the way to go, and that's going to involve some work on your part. Uh, the kids aren't going to be required to have a firearms <clears throat> safety certificate until they are uh, 12 years of age, they'll they'll have it at that point. Kids can take the class at 11, uh, but <clears throat> even before that, you know, when when my child took my my oldest took her firearm safety last year, um, she was well prepared for it just because these were things that we had been practicing as a family, as gun owners, and just preparing for turkey hunting. And this is a great way to do that. So biggest tip I can give: work your kids along slowly, very slowly. I can't emphasize that enough. You're going to start out with a BB gun, shooting pellets. You know, there's no recoil on a BB gun. It's just a plink, plink, plink. You'll move up to a 22 rifle, and then eventually you can make that move to a shotgun. Uh, and I would be argument uh, at the at an elementary school level you'd, to be shooting on a 410. Uh, just a handful of years ago, the 410 uh, caliber uh, uh, shotgun was was approved to be used. You know, modern ballistics have come a long way. And uh, 410 is an acceptable um, size for shotgun hunters, so that works well for the elementary. I would argue probably at middle school, you'd think about a 20 gauge, and at the high school level, a 12 gauge. And a lot of it has to do with recoil. Um, at the end of the day, uh, if you really want to avoid the recoil, you can spend the money to get a semi-automatic shotgun, which is going to recycle that energy um, and put it back into cycling around versus putting it into the kick that lands on your shoulder. Uh, but I know not everyone can afford semi-auto shotguns at uh, at different gauges, especially at small gauges, that they aren't likely to hunt a lot. 
Make sure that you bring the safety equipment, probably first and foremost thing I should have pointed out. So you see in the photo, I've got Quinn here, um, one of my daughters, and she's got on safety glasses. You can't see it because her hair is over her ears, but she does have uh, the, the earplugs wedged in there. Um, that's what we always are working on. It's a great way to get that kid used to the shot without the really heavy bang noise. Um, and it's just good safety measure, right? You want to protect your hearing, and protect your eyes when you're out there. And that goes, I'll mention, that goes not only for the child doing the shooting, but for you as a parent modeling that good behavior and protecting your ears and eyes as well, too. Uh, and I, I, I hit on this a little bit, right? Ballistics have come a long way on turkey ammunition. Um, I know the TSS loads are quite expensive that you'll see at the gun shops or the outdoor big box stores. Um, they are expensive, but boy, are they effective. Um, this, you, you have a chance to pattern them. You'll see that for yourself or just reading up on them. You know, it can be a mix of different um, material types for the BBs as well as size arrangements and ends up throwing a, a pretty wild pattern that is, is effective and does result in kills uh, at a healthy range. Continuing on that uh, firearm safety and gun training element, um, I'm recommending folks use a paper turkey head target because we want to get those kids used to the idea of we want to make a clean, efficient, and effective kill. And what I often tell kids is aim for the bubbles, right? They, that's the, the technical term is caruncles. Um, you kind of see the waddle that comes down and leads up to those bubbles on the neck or caruncles. Um, if you're putting it squared up like you see in the reticle picture here on, on this turkey head paper target, um, if you're aiming for that area, it gives you a little bit of leeway on either side. There's room for error if you shoot high or you shoot low that you're still going to deliver enough shots to the neck and spine uh, and the head to, to deliver a killing shot. So recommend those paper head targets just because uh, kids are going to get used to what it looks like lining up on a turkey's head. The thing you're going to want to stress with your kid is accuracy is the most important thing that we are keyed in on. We, if we want to deliver a killing shot, it has to be on target. Uh, and we have to consistently be on target. We have to build those marksmanship skills up, again, starting with the BB gun, then going to the 22, and eventually to the shotgun. It's a building process. Um, accuracy is what we're focused on. Later, later is when you work on the speed. And what I tell my kids, and you might tell yours, is that when we are hunting turkeys, they will come into our effective range to see what's going on, to check out decoys or calls, but they're not going to hang around forever. Eventually, they're going to know that the gig is up, something is off, and they're going to alarm putt and walk away. Uh, so you can't, you know, if you've you got a child that it takes them a full minute to line up on a target, it, it's not going to be effective. So we start by pushing accuracy. That's the most important thing. And then we work on the, on the speed. It's something like, all right, I want you to get four shots that are on target, that are killing shots, uh, and do four or five shots within, you know, say, 30 seconds. So they have some time to get things lined up, and they get used to pushing the speed element a little bit to get that shot off. Start early with your shooting practice. Give yourself a lot of time. You know, we're starting right now. Uh, the weather's turned warm enough. We didn't get much snow this year. We have about six weeks before the turkey season kicks off. You should really be practicing with that young person as much as your schedule allows, at least a couple times per week, uh, starting now through the season opening. That gives you a little lead time, leeway uh, to, to build these skills up and allow that kid to improve over time. Just know, with practice shooting, there are going to be ups and downs. Your kids are going to have to battle through some gun shyness and recoil challenges, especially if it's their first time ever shooting on guns. I can't stress this enough. Do not force kids to take shots they don't want to take. They need to have the confidence. Uh, they, they should want to try shooting at different uh, guns and learning on these. But don't ever force them to do something they don't want to do. Uh, you know, we are, we're, we're introducing these kids into the outdoors. We want them to have a good experiences. We want to build on that foundation for the long haul. Make sure they're learning to be comfortable and confident shooting firearms. You're going to know when your child is ready, when they can hit the target with a shotgun pellet load consistently and put it right on the mark where it needs to be. And a line that I like to use uh, with both my daughters as I get into practice seasons the line from uh, Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, you know how you get to Carnegie Hall, don't you? Practice. So 
that we'd break out that line uh, about how you need to practice, you need to practice, you need to practice. Uh, and in a way, it does a few things. One, it builds the marksmanship skills that they're going to need. Uh, but it's also honoring your quarry, right? You're putting in the time. Uh, you're learning the ballistics of your particular load at a certain distance with your gun so that you can take a quick ethical and killing shot. And if we're not practicing and we don't take a good shot and we wound an animal, in this case a turkey, we hurt the animal and we give a child a very poor experience, which is likely uh, something that could you know, chase them away from wanting to participate in hunting. So put in the time. Uh, these hunting opportunities are earned, not given. Put the time into practice. All right, where are we going to be hunting? That's always the big question. <clears throat> Hopefully you have already got property lined up. If you're an experienced turkey hunter, uh, maybe you have some places that are lined up already. Uh, if not, start thinking about the future, whether it is for this season or into the future. Uh, start scouting, you know, public or private lands where you have permission and where you don't, right? And even in places where you don't have permission, you're still learning what the birds are doing, how they're behaving, kind of what is happening out there. Um, if you do hunt public, plan to get in early and know that you may encounter other hunters. Just be mindful of this with your setup and takedown. When you pack in and out, you should be putting some blaze orange on and just paying attention to where other people are going, traveling. Um, and you just have to understand there may be other folks that are out there and there's a safety component to that. And I do have a few thoughts uh, on asking for hunting permission. In my experience, when you ask for permission for deer and pheasant hunting, it's kind of like asking a landowner for their firstborn. I will say turkeys seem to be an easier ask and it's all relative, don't get me wrong. Your batting average is still gonna be very low. Um, people may not want hunters out there. They may have other people already lined up. Uh, but I, I, I always say, you know, the worst uh, that can happen is to be told no. And if that's the worst thing that can happen, try to have the courage to pick up the phone or drop by a house or, or you know, talk to a landowner. Um, you know, when you are working with that landowner, uh, try to work with their schedule. Find out if there's other hunters and, you, you know, give those other hunters a wide berth. Be respectful of the other hunters. Be respectful of the landowner's wishes. Um, just be respectful of that landowner and make sure that you thank them. You know, be polite, be, be, be thankful. Um, I like to check in with my hunter, with my landowners throughout the year. And I do like to uh, uh, drop off some gifts and I like to keep them appraised. My girls actually write thank you letters to our landowners, telling them about some of the experiences we had turkey hunting. And uh, we'll try to leave some gifts for them, maybe some summer sausage from uh, venison uh, that we, that'll make up or a package of walleye fillets or something like that. It's always nice to, to show some thanks and just show your gratitude too. just express it, right? Tell them about these awesome experiences you had and how you had a chance to share that with your kids. So, and it certainly never helps if you're walking up to ask for permission to bring a couple kids along and get them involved, have them do the asking. Um, it's a lot of times folks like to see that, hey, somebody's, it's, it's not just John Q public that gets to hunt all over the place. It's a kid going out for the first time. So really, this isn't you doing all the work and, and the kid just, you know, pulling the trigger. You really have to let the kids be part of the process. They do need to be involved um, or even lead the process. So think about all the things uh, that the kid, uh, that your child can do during uh, spring turkey hunting season. They can help scout. It's kind of fun to drive around with binoculars or even get out in the woods a little bit, check things out, see if you see sign dusting bowls or birds that are active, strutters or groups that are out, are they in big family groups still, have they broken down, um, what's happening throughout the course of the season, scouting and ahead of the season. Um, asking for the land permission, we talked about that just a minute ago, putting up trail cameras. I do enjoy um, kind of seeing the birds throughout the year and certainly during the season, if they're occupying certain part, portions of the property, how big a groups they're traveling in, uh, can kind of get some of that information by putting up trail cameras. Setting up blinds, um, <clears throat> I will set up uh, a handful of blinds in different locations. It gives me some options on, you know, responding to the wind or where I'm seeing a lot of bird activity or, um, you know, facing where the sun is rising or setting. Um, you know, I'll put out those blinds and that's a great opportunity to take the kids out so they know, hey, here's where we're sticking the blinds, here's where we're going to be, um, here's what the blind looks like, all that fun stuff. 
Helping call birds. That's a big one, right? Get those kids slate calls, box calls, teach them how to use those calls at home. It's just fun. It's that anticipation side of the hunt. They learn how to do it, how to sound like a turkey. And at the day, at the end of the day, they don't have to be perfect. Uh, longtime turkey hunters will tell you, we've all sat out there in the woods, heard some God awful yelping and thought, man, you know, what hunter is so bad at calling? And then out walks some raggedy looking men. So uh, birds don't always sound perfect. Uh, you don't have to sound perfect either. Uh, I would definitely recommend, you know, those kids can help put out the decoys, right? A uh, great way for them to know how those decoys work and you can talk to them about where you want them and what they should look like, or even if it's just picking them up at the end of a session. And then finally, get them involved in the in that dietary portion of the process, right? They can help clean and cook harvested birds. And we've got a picture here of some turkey meat that we made into some uh, uh, seasoned uh, seasoned and cooked pulled meat for for tacos so they got to be involved in the whole process and the beauty of it is hey they're going to learn not just about turkeys but other wildlife uh, see a lot of cool things out there um, pretty soon they're going to know you know what's a juvenile male turkey called what's a female turkey called How about a mature male turkey they're learning all these different things about how these birds behave what's happening in the woods in the spring let them be a part of that whole process and I would lastly say, as you're preparing uh, for, for things to kick off, you can watch some turkey hunting videos uh, to really learn about what a hunt looks like if a kid has never been on one. Um, I would just advise though, you know, if you're heading out to YouTube, make sure that you're pre-screening those videos for language. Uh, and then a kill reaction is the other thing. Um, I think that this is a good segue just to mention that I think there is there is an appropriate reverence that you should have. I mean, you can be happy, believe, believe me. Uh, I've always been, uh, you know, happy and, and uh, relieved and very excited at times to to be able to harvest a, a turkey and uh, you know there's nothing wrong with that bit of celebration and excitement uh, you had all that adrenaline building as that bird moved in closer and closer uh, but you also want to show some reverence and some respect and and uh, not every uh, video that's out there on the internet is is representative of what we want to be showing as hunters uh, how we can be respectful how we can honor the animal that sort of thing all right, I'm going to talk for a minute about sleep training. This is a unique element as far as I'm concerned to spring turkey hunting. And in my opinion, it is one of the worst things about turkey hunting with kids because we have some very extremely early starts in the morning. Uh, as you all know, the days are growing longer and longer. Uh, we get to the uh, we get to, <clears throat> to the spring, uh, well, the summer solstice will come in June. We will be barreling towards the equinox here pretty quick, and uh, the days just continue to get longer and longer. When you look at that, our season kicks off on April 17th, and first light, uh, not sunrise, but first light, 30 minutes before sunrise, when uh, when shooting seasons will start up, um, is 5.51 on April 17th. By May 31st, first light is at 4.59. And when you think about the fact that you want to get out to the blind early, so you're not spooking birds and you want to get out. Uh, you may have to make a short drive, depending on how far away you live from your hunting spot. Um, and you need to grab breakfast and you need to do all these things. That means you're, you know, moving, moving that alarm clock further and further back, getting up at three in the morning, four in the morning. Those are very early days uh, in the spring. So you really have to think about how you're going to handle the sleep training side of it. Uh, get those kids to bed early, uh, especially on school nights. They, they, they learn. They'll learn, they'll be really tired, but they'll learn, hey, we need to go, bed, go to bed a bit earlier if we're gonna hunt the next day. And then, you know, try to think about, this isn't so much a sleep training thing, but just be mindful of, hey, if those kids are heading off to school, let's make sure that we have an email address or something that we can let the school know if we're gonna be in late. I have lived this in real time, right? We're sitting in a blind, there's birds coming from one side, there's birds coming from another. I'm getting close to, you know, my drop dead time when I have to get out of there to get to school on time. I used to worry about this when I first started taking the kids out, but both uh, members of the school, teacher friends of mine have said, you know, there's nothing so important that you can't be a little bit late to school. Uh, those kids, those kids, many kids do not get the experience that you're giving to that kid. They're going to learn a ton uh, out there uh, in the <laughs> in the turkey woods, in the blind, in the real world. So uh, get out there and if you're a little bit late, it's not a big deal. Most schools are pretty understanding. And let them sleep in the blind if they're tired. And one thing I'll note uh, in this picture of my daughter taking a little nap in the blind is 
I have, this must have been from a few years ago because I try to make it a habit of removing all the dry leaves from the inside of the blind. As you can imagine, kids like to fidget when they step on those dry leaves. It makes a lot of noise. Usually I pitch those out of there, but in this picture, I did not do that. So a little pro tip for you there, just because I see it, uh, try to get those leaves out of there so the kids don't make a bunch of noise. I always carry a great big backpack into our turkey blind. So what is in the bag? What is in that backpack that I'm carrying out there? Well, I'll tell you, the essentials for a turkey hunt with a young person. You might think it's a gun or a tag or this or that. Well, you need those things. But the essentials when you're hunting with kids are things that will keep them in the game longer. You gotta have snacks and drinks. Maybe it's breakfast that you're packing, planning to eat at some point uh, so they're not going hungry books or games. It's a great thing for a kid to sit there and read a book while we're waiting uh, for time to pass. Uh, and a blanket or pillow, like I said, uh, you know, if, you, if they need to catch a little nap, if they're feeling pretty tired, let them grab a nap. If, if, uh, if a bird is coming in, you just have to work something out. Hey, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder. I need you to quietly get up and, and get ready because your moment may be coming. Of course, we want them to pay attention. We want them to learn those wood skills and uh, engage fully in a turkey hunt. Uh, but we also have to work on the practical side of making sure that it's a fun, enjoyable experience for them. So uh, those are good ways. And a lot of times, honestly, there's not that much time with a head in a book or on a on a game or, or even taking naps. More often than not, my kids are sitting out there taking in the spectacle, right? Seeing all the fun stuff that you get to see, hearing all the things that, that happen, uh, birds gobbling on the roost, coming into fields, coming off, coming into the woods, uh, working their way through you name it, uh, we get to see a lot of cool things and that usually is engaging enough uh, for my kids. That being said, we do still have to have some, you know, turkey hunting gear specific to, to turkey hunting, right? Got to have that youth tag. We've talked about that a little bit already. Um, make sure if you're picking up a youth tag, uh, the, if you're doing it for the first time, make sure that you go in with the child's full name, date of birth, and social security number. Uh, when they're getting that very first license, they don't have anything to refer to. It's the first time buying a license. They're not going to be in the state system. The only way to look them up is that Social Security. Eventually, they'll have a, their own unique Minnesota DNR ID number. But up until that point, make sure you have all your all your ducks in a row with Social Security number, birth date, uh, and, and name. So be careful when you're buying that first uh, tag. Make sure, you know, I mentioned a little bit about how we like to run ground blinds. Uh, I would advise as well that you pick up some upgraded stakes. Um, I found that most companies are selling stakes that are pretty flimsy, pretty small. Uh, if you go to a camping store, get the really heavy duty stakes that are long and thick. Um, you can drive those into the ground. It's going to keep your blind out there. I'm putting a blind out for turkey hunting with the with my girls, and it is staying out for basically two whole months before I'm going to take it back down. And in that time, a lot can happen. Um, and it's an amazing transformation in the spring season. We go from these really cold mornings with freezing temperatures to hot and muggy and mosquitoes flying around. And you know, sometimes we'll have wasps that start to build nests on the inside of these uh, blinds. So you have to be careful when you're going in there. Spiders might be making webs. Um, box elder bugs and ladybugs crawling in there. So just be careful of what you're stepping into. Be mindful of that, but upgrade those stakes. The other thing I like to do is get some 220 paracord and you're going to lash uh, some of the outside of the hubs of these pop-up uh, pop lines to whatever you can anchor to. Maybe there's a nice big tree that you're set up underneath or next to. Tie that paracord off. Um, I have come out after some very strong winds, very strong rainstorms, and seen my blind knocked over. You know, I just, I need to put it back up, stake it back down, but at least it's not blowing into the next county. That paracord can save you some heartache. Uh, make sure you've got warm camouflage layers. If you don't want to spend money um, on, the, on the youth camouflage, knowing that your kids are going to grow out of it in a year or two, just substitute black clothing, right? Take a black sweatshirt and black. Uh, sweatpants, turn the, turn the sweatshirt inside out so it's facing black. Um, you're sitting inside of a blind where it's black on black and that's going to work really well. And get yourself some wool socks to keep those feet warm in the early season and get a good pair of boots. You're walking through. Um, sometimes you're coming after the rainfall. Sometimes there's just snow melt and the ground is muddy and wet from, from the winter that's receding. 
uh, you end up walking in a lot of times with concrete blocks on your feet, just thick gumbo mud that's stuck to your boots. And if you've got a kid walking out there in tennis shoes and cotton socks, they're going to have soaking wet, cold feet. So make sure you get them a good pair of boots and some wool socks. Um, pick up a head net for them and some gloves, uh, camouflage, just because they're inexpensive. And if a turkey's going to see anything, um, they're probably going to see that that uh, that face facing out at them. Uh, let's make sure we cover that up and cover up those hands as well. Give them a headlamp. Um, we're walking in the dark a lot of times, going in early, and we want to make sure that uh, they can see where they're going so they're having a good experience. We don't want them tripping over furrows in a farm field or not seeing a, a fallen tree and trip over that. Um, give them a headlamp so they can follow right behind you. A lot of times my girls, they're right next to me. And then, you know, we know we're coming up on a spot where the birds are typically roosted. I say, okay, now we're gonna shut off the lights and move a little slower. I can hold my hand and we'll work our way through the woods until we can get to where our blinds are set up. Decoys, <clears throat> I'm really a believer for youth hunts that a decoy makes a lot of sense. I know turkey hunters uh, that, that go without a decoy because they want those birds responding to calls. They want those birds coming into their setups, looking around, looking for a bird, uh, you know, trying to spur them to move closer and closer to look for that bird. In this case, I think the decoy is the way to go because a bird if it's a Jake, if it's a, a Tom, they're, they're going to get locked on to that decoy and then they're not going to be paying attention to the blind that's nearby. It's just a way to, to keep their attention off of what's, uh, what's going on around them. Continuing on that gear list. So we're going to use that shotgun uh, that, that your child is trained in on. Uh, you don't want to do a bait and switch, right? We learned on one gun, but we're going to shoot a different one. Make sure we're, we're using that shotgun that the kid's all trained in on. Um, this isn't necessarily for the hunt, uh, but obviously it's for the preparation side. You got to have those paper turkey targets, uh, the turkey heads. Make sure you got some of those for sighting in. Uh, ammunition. This was a bigger deal back in the pandemic when ammunition was off the shelves, but make sure you've got enough ammunition both to sight in the gun and to have a handful of rounds on hand for hunt. Hunters miss. Turkey hunters miss. Diehard turkey hunters miss. I miss. Uh, it happens to everyone. If you haven't missed when you're turkey hunting, it, you just haven't hunted long enough. Eventually it will happen to you. So it certainly happens with kids. Uh, let's make sure we have enough ammunition on hand and ready uh, so that if they have an opportunity for a second shot, we have it right there, third shot, whatever it takes. One of the, one of the big tips um, that I think that makes a huge difference for youth hunters are these two um, items that I'm about to hit on. <clears throat> one is the red dot sight. Uh, so we're fixing that. Uh, onto the rear sight of, uh, or you know, close to where your where your receiver is on your shotgun, the very top of the uh, barrel, and that is putting up a sight picture. We've got a, a two minute of impact or two minute of angle um, a reticle. So I've got this great big circle, and <clears throat> what I'm doing is now, as a hunter, uh, my kid doesn't have to just look for this little tiny dot and you know, have to put that on the waddle or the caruncles of the turkey. Instead, I have this great big red dot that I see looking down the barrel of my gun. And it really simplifies it for kids. I just need to line that up on the neck, the caruncles, the waddle, and that's where I'm taking the shot. Um, it really simplifies it for kids. So I can't, uh, I can't say enough good things about putting a red dot sight on for young turkey hunters. And I'm seeing a lot of YouTube hunters that are moving in this direction as well. And the other one that really makes a big difference is having a tripod with a shotgun mount. We're talking about kids that can't hold five, six, seven pounds of shotgun up for minutes at a time. I mean, their arms get tired. It just doesn't work for them. The best thing you can do is get that tripod. In this case, I've got a Primos tripod, Jim uh, Shockey shooting sticks, and I've mounted a Primos uh, shotgun of holding mount on there. Uh, and those kids are able to lay that gun like you see in the photo right on that mount. And you're taking that mount and that tripod with you to the practice field. So that kid is getting the chance to swivel around and turn that gun because that's what they're going to have to do. They can make small movements up and down and left and right. And we have a pretty big area of our blind window uh, that we can swivel through and cover. Uh, so that really makes a big difference for kids not having to hold that gun up 
um, teaching them, taking the safety off and taking the shot when they are ready and only when they're ready. Mention, of course, a backpack for all the gear that we're bringing out there. And then guess what? Um, comfortable chairs or stools, it makes a big difference. Those kids and you as the mentor are sitting there for long periods of time. Uh, I typically don't engage in marathon all day hunts with my kids. It's, you know, I'm picking a few hours in the morning, maybe a few hours in the afternoon or close to evening roost time. And that's about it. Um, we really don't want to, you know, wear them out from making them spend too much time out there. We want these to be fun experiences, but for both parties, let's make sure you've got comfortable chairs, test them out before you buy them. So uh, some tips for your season. Let's talk about expectations, right? We are going to define success by setting a low bar. And I guess low bar is probably in the eye of the beholder a little bit, but I'll explain what I mean by that. Well, let's just pull in some statistics out. Um, the 2023 season, there were 12,343 permits that were issued uh, and there was 2,569 harvest recorded. That comes in a little over 20% uh, for a success rate based on reported, uh, you know, that doesn't account for non-reporting. That means one out of five kids is filling a tag. Those are not great odds, right? You know, you'd be sent down to the minor leagues if you batted 200. And if if Steph Curry shot 20% from the three-point line, uh, he wouldn't be employed in the NBA. It's not a great it's not a great number, but it does put it into perspective. Uh, this isn't all about filling a tag and killing a bird. This is about having a great experience out there. And that is not only true of youth hunters, that's true of all turkey hunters. The last University of Minnesota uh, Fish and Wildlife Co-op Unit uh, survey that was done uh, as, a, as a, you know, in, in, in uh, association with Minnesota DNR through the University of Minnesota, uh, Sue Schrader's 2015 report talked about hunter satisfaction being t highest and tied to seeing birds and hearing birds. It wasn't necessarily that they went out and shot a turkey. It was that they saw or heard birds. And that's really the, a great benchmark to set. Did you get to see some? Did you get to hear some? And if you've done your scouting and found some nice locations, you can usually meet that bar. And then really, it this is what anyone will tell you that hunts turkeys. It's about the amazing experiences you have out there. It's the things that you see, uh, the fun that you have out there. Um, <laughs> I can remember so many. My my background image right here is uh, I, in, was was taken inside uh, the turkey blind with one of my daughters. We were sitting there, and of course, turkey hunters can use an owl hoot as a locator call for gobblers. Sometimes we'll do that if we're trying to figure out what blind we should go to or where to set up. I you know was just sitting there vocalizing a barred owl call. You know, doing doing some some owl calls, and I've I've done this before. <laughs> Lo and behold, this uh, this barred owl right here came flying onto the branch in front of us, silhouetted against the rising sun, and was looking around to where this owl was. So that's just one example of probably hundreds that I have uh, from sitting in the sitting in the turkey woods with my kids. Some of the unique things that happen out there. Did you have fun? That's that's kind of the bar to set. I ask my kids every time that we're walking out back to the truck, whether we're carrying a bird out with us or not, did you have fun out there? usually get a get a good answer and they'll tell me something that they saw or heard or experienced during that uh, respective session one big one here is utilize the flexibility of that youth tag right we laid out how the spring youth turkey season works hunt when you can um, my my day job working with fisheries is going to pull me into the field on some weekends and you know i'm gonna have to be in to do some field work uh, but if you can get away and, and pull the kid out, try to spend a couple hours getting into the turkey blind. And the big one, hunt when the weather is fair, right? Gobbling behavior correlates to fair weather. If it's not windy and rainy, uh, bird activity a lot of times is tied into weather. And having an enjoyable experience is tied into weather too, right? The kids don't want to be out there when it's, you know, freezing cold and the rain is coming in to the blind sideways. Uh, you're not likely to kill a lot of birds in those conditions. Be one thing if you're a marathon diehard hunter and you want to put every available hour of hunting in that you can, uh, that's your prerogative. But with the kids, hunt when the weather is fair. And bottom line, commune with nature. Enjoy that time that you're out there. Learn some wood skills, how to be out 
in nature, how to walk quietly through the woods, how to how to observe and see all these wonderful things happening around you. And you're going to go through a two month period where you literally see spring come alive. Every additional session that you're sitting out there, the leaves on the on the trees and on on the shrubs are getting a little bit bigger. We're going through the spring ephemeral flowers. Morel mushrooms are popping up. Deer are coming out and even a few fawns showing up. Uh, um, well, typically that's on the early side by the end of late May, but it does happen uh, as you see in that photo. But all these amazing things happen, right? So it's a great opportunity to sit still, be quiet. And and that those two things, those two things really matter. Don't be moving around a lot. Don't be making a lot of noise. Turkey have incredible senses. They can see in incredibly well. Uh, you just you just can't afford to move. And their hearing is is top notch. You know, many turkey hunters have, have talked about that if a wild turkey had the nose of a white tailed deer, you'd never be able to kill one. And that's the one the one uh, sense that is a little weak on wild turkeys. They don't rely on the sense of smell for much of anything. Um, a lot of times they rely on white-tailed deer to smell danger and tell them, you know, set them off, <laughs> flag, flag or bounce away or snort at you. That's uh, a lot of times there's that uh, sort of relation or symbiotic relationship, right, where the turkeys and the deer are traveling together and the turkeys are, are in on when something is amiss when a white-tailed deer uh, smells you. So sit still, be quiet, do the best that you can out there to not uh disturb any turkeys to not give them any reason not to come into you and a funny little story about that learning how to sit quietly and patiently is what my uh, daughter told me last year when we were walking in for her first hunt dad i promise to be quiet cora not crazy cora so very well stated she understood the assignment be quiet and we're going to see it and see a lot more turkeys come in close so bottom line is this, enjoy. These are the good old days. This is some of the funnest hunting that you have, some of the best experiences. You know, if you're taking a, a child into the outdoors and this is their first hunt, they're gonna learn a great deal. At the end of the day, when, when they turn 18 and become an adult, if they never uh, uh, hunt again, if the worst thing that they can say is uh, that we had a great time out hunting with mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, aunt, uncle, friend, neighbor, um, if that's the worst thing they can say, then you still ended up winning. Uh, it's just about having good experiences, having fun out there. You do get to see some incredible things, you know, coyotes that have been running around, raccoons that come up to the blind, um, seeing all the songbirds that move through as, as migration uh, goes, uh, goes along through the spring season, seeing a pair of wood ducks kind of flying through the trees, deer that come walking up to your blind, trying to smell you, find out what's going on. Uh, these really are enjoyable times that you're never going to forget. I've got all kinds of stories that my daughters will tell and are telling uh, from their time out there. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. The last couple things I'll mention is, hey, really be mindful. There's some really dry uh, conditions that are happening out in uh, across Minnesota with the drought that we're in. So uh, be aware of that. The other thing that's happening, we have a, a very early start to the tick season. Cannot tell you enough. Take preventative measures for that. Um, I end up taking uh, my daughter's clothing and and at the start of the season, putting a good uh, uh, amount of permethrin on there just to make sure we don't have ticks crawling up on them. Uh, make sure you're doing tick checks. Uh, this is gonna be an early start where we're gonna see a lot of ticks this year. We don't want anyone to be picking up a disease uh, uh, and have to deal with some of those side effects. So uh, be mindful of those ticks, watch out for those dry conditions. Well, that I'll take any questions. Awesome job, Scott. It's just having that. I wish I would have listened to this webinar, you know, eight, nine years ago when my kids were a little bit lit, younger and had some of those more and better experiences. So some great tips on there. I love this last photo of your daughter drinking the, the pink milk. Chocolate milk and pink milk were two of the favorites of my girls. And she usually ended up picking up either on the way home or taking out to the blind with us. So. Well, and my, my wife likes to tell me that I bribe the kids to get them out there, but uh, I think looking back on some of my formative experiences of, of fishing, you know, one of the things I looked forward to with my grandpa was, you know, on the way back from the lake, we'd pick up a soda and a candy bar or go to an ice cream shop, and he was always buying us a treat. And again, that's the reinforcement of the idea that we're out there to have fun and have these really 
really unique fun experiences out in the woods. And uh, yeah, if, if that helps enrich the experience and make it a lot more fun, great. Eventually you're gonna segue into it being about being out there and maybe the food and the treats won't be as big of a deal, but I wanna make sure that we're reinforcing having fun and having a good time because it, it makes it that much easier. Yeah, and I, lo I love the point where you you know, said you can get you can hunt the whole season with these youth permits, and they're they're free in Minnesota if the kids are under thirteen, I believe. And That's thirteen correct. to seventeen, I think it's a five dollar um, tag, so yep. it's pretty economical. Even you know, jumping across the border to hunt at friends' place or wherever in Wisconsin, I think it's a seven dollar tag over there. So it's it's a cheap way to get outside and enjoy a little bit of nature with your kids. Which yeah, is totally. always a positive. So, uh, so far, if you have any questions for Scott, please put them in the Q&A section in there. We got one in there from our friend Jeff wondering, what is a TSS load? I don't know if you okay, know so, I had to Google it. <laughs> yep, I'm trying to remember. Um, if you remember, what is the what is the acronym again? It's Tungsten, Tungsten Super Steel. Thank you. Super Shot. Okay, tungsten super shot, and uh, I knew it began with tungsten. So we're playing around with the, well, I should say, ammunition companies playing around with ballistics, and starting off with this tungsten. So if you know tungsten, it's uh, incredibly dense, and it's got this this great knockdown power because of its density, right? And that's something where it's even denser than than lead. And we're trying to use the elemental properties of these different alloys of these different elements to maximize ballistic performance and take smaller size shot and you know make it hit harder and yeah you know you're going to pay a lot more for these types of precious metals than you will for lead um, but you'll experience better ballistic performance so the tss shot um, has become a kind of a market phenomenon you're seeing it spread over to waterfall users um, and it certainly you know cut its teeth and started off amongst a lot of turkey hunters. And, uh, you know, there's folks uh, with our ammunition companies here in Minnesota that could, you know, really go on and on about how the how that evolution of TSS shot went around. But, you know, at the end of the day, the simplest thing I can say about it is it performs very well. Yes, it's expensive, but you you kind of get, you get something for the expense of it. That's why I, I say ration it carefully. You know, you're only gonna need to shoot it a couple times if the kids are on target when you're sighting in. And then after that, you just need a couple more, you know, on hand for the hunts, but uh, it really performs well, does well. I think, you know, turkeys are super hardy birds and being, you know, like yourself or myself, we can go out there and shoot a 12 gauge, three and a half inch shell that has a little more oomph to it. But when you're talking a, a smaller bodied person or a youth, you know, shooting that 410, I think it's even more important to get that heavy shot yeah. to uh, get that knockdown power or so. Yep, good point. It's, exactly. It's worth the extra money for that. Um, William was, he said, you've missed the first minute, first few minutes of the show. Um, what do you think is the youngest age to take a kid out turkey or deer hunting? So we talked about this at the beginning a little bit, and it's really, you know, up to the parent and how the kid is, right? Yeah. So the, the, you know, we'll go back and be able to watch it uh, uh, when it's in video format, but basically, the state of Minnesota doesn't put a requirement for age on there. I don't know a lot of states. Some of the states are really dropping that just because every kid is a little bit different. The best piece of advice I'm giving parents or mentors or grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, whoever is taking these kids out is they need to gauge the readiness of that child. However, you're going to go about that. You know, you have to put in the time to earn this opportunity. That's gun handling. Um, practicing, being, showing proficiency, being able to make the shots, starting with the BB gun, moving to the 22, moving to whatever shotgun you're using and putting the time in there and being, you know, being responsible enough to do that and showing that. And then there's the maturity side. Are you able to, are you going to be able to handle making a kill? And that's a, a very deep conversation you have to have with this young person. Is this something that you want to try? Um, there's a lot that's baked into that. You know, you may have had pets and, and lost pets. You may have dealt with the loss of a family member or friend. So a kid may understand death a little bit, but uh, when it's a whole different matter when you're taking a life. So there's a certain amount of maturity that has to be there. And that's where you as the as the leader of this hunt are, are really gonna have to gauge that kid 
uh, and and make your own decision. You know, as I said, and this may have been missed uh, if if somebody joined in late, but I've seen kids that are not even in kindergarten yet that are very much into hunting, have put the time in, and are capable of making kills. And then I've seen some teenagers that I don't think are at that point, don't have the maturity or uh, aren't able to stand in and and put in the work. So every kid is a little bit different. And I like you pointing out too that I, I wish I would have done more with my kids, but just bringing them out when they're not hunting, just bring them out in the blind just to get that experience and hang out there. Um, turkey hunting is one of those, if you're hunting from a blind, it's not too bad to have a kid with. You don't have to worry about getting up in a tree stand. It's generally the weather's pretty decent, so they're not you know, cold or super wet or anything. So just getting them out there and getting that exposure. And I think there's a lot, you know, we've talked before about, and we have an episode just a couple episodes ago about the health benefits of just being outside and being in nature. But I think Scott will probably agree with me that just being a parent there with your kids, having that, you know, not on the screen time, not talking about a football game that's on or band concert or whatever, but just being out there and being present with your kids is super valuable too. So. Yeah, I would agree with everything you just said. You said a mouthful there about the importance of getting out, the health benefits of it. Um, you know, I, you can even throw a heater into that blind. You can throw hot packs in. I mean, try to dress for the weather. I've got a picture on this slide of my daughter in her ice fishing bibs. It was a particularly cold spring that year. And, um, you know, just making them comfortable and uh, having a good experience out there. But yeah, it's that exposure and it's, and it's, we'll go to the same turkey woods that I've hunted and we may go out there just to look for morel mushrooms and uh, bump around. And the kids are kind of trained in to know that while well, we're also keeping an eye out to see what the turkeys are doing. Um, you know, you can just go on a nature hike. Um, I'm just lucky to have access to some public and private lands that we can get out on. And there, there's always a good experience. There's never what feels like a waste of day because you get to see so many unique things. Um, so many plants that are emerging, birds that are coming back around, even early in the season when the woods are somewhat sterile and, you know, right around now and in, in end of February or March, there still are a lot of cool things you can see out there. Cup, uh, cup mushrooms that are coming up, uh, some of the earliest ones that come out of the ground, um, you know, just seeing what's happened with the leaf litter and, uh, you know, what the trees are looking like and where, where animals are moving around, where, where signs are. If there's any cast antlers or sheds, um, there's always something to do. There's never a bad day uh, to get a, get a kid outdoors. I like that. There is never a bad day. I think there's there's plenty of days where I've chosen to do lawn work or plant the garden in that I would have rather been outside. But I've never been out with my kids, you know, fishing or walking in the woods and thought, boy, I would have had better time sitting at home doing my yard yeah. work. So, right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> William. To follow up your point about other things out in the woods, William, I made a comment that a lot of turkey hunting tips apply to deer hunting also. So you're building on these experiences, right? So, so yeah, great, great. Perfect dovetailing. Um, you know, there's familiarity with the ground blind. You made that great point that you don't need to uh, climb up a tree, which can sometimes be a, a little concerning being elevated and the safety risk, but get familiarity with the ground blind, get familiar familiar with the property, see a little bit of bird behavior, well, turkey behavior, but also white-tailed deer. So you're right, there's quite a bit of dovetailing of skill sets, some of that woodsmanship uh, that you learn, what you need to do, um, what you need to be paying attention to, how to how to blend in more or less and be a part of nature instead of sticking out like a sore thumb. So those are all good things for, for any sort of hunting. You're absolutely right. And Ron put a comment in here, fantastic presentation, nicely done. Thank you, Ron. So uh, we had one other question from Jeff. I'm hearing that turkey populations are decreasing in some parts of the state and other parts of the country. Do wild wildlife biologists have any idea yet why this may be happening? Well, I tell you what, um, certainly I've, I've heard that as well. Um, Dr. Tim Lyons is our upland game research scientist who was able to provide me with uh, some of the information on the turkey hunt numbers and the Sioux Schrader um, turkey hunter satisfaction survey when it was last done. Um, you know, 
Dr. Lyons is going to be pretty well tuned in to what's happening with his colleagues. I work on the fishery side of the coin, so I'd, I wouldn't want to get into the speculation side, but I know I've heard a lot of podcasts kind of on the topic of, you know, what's happening, landscape level impacts to habitat, um, so, you know, some states that have allowed more than one bird to be harvest or harvested and um, what sort of allowances there are for, for turkey harvest. And, you know, a lot of things kind of in, in play, um, predator management, a number of different things. So I think there's a lot playing into it perhaps, but um, I'm not gonna take a stab at it only just because I think Dr. Lyons would be the better person to reach out to. So if you, uh, if you wanna take that question, um, it's uh, timothy.lyons, L-Y-O-N-S at state.mn.us. I can give you some answers to a question like that. Maybe a maybe a future webinar idea, huh? Absolutely. I would think speculate that turkeys are probably if this spring holds up like it has been, they're probably going to have a pretty good year with um, the clutches this year. But I'm not a wildlife biologist either, so yeah, I I you know I think about whether it's fish or wildlife that uh, there just seems to be, and probably true for flora as well. Um, that there's seem to be winners and losers in different uh, in different scenarios with our our climate and weather, and uh, certainly in a year like this where they weren't have to you know a lot of birds not didn't have to battle uh, to get through a bunch of snow to feed whether it's uh, ringneck pheasants or wild turkeys. The flip side of that is looking at a bird like rough grouse, right? They usually want to have a fair amount of snow, uh, so they're able to burrow in and be insulated against extreme cold. So uh, there's Yin and yang to everything, and uh, but I would expect there'd be pretty pretty nice survivorship uh, of young birds, uh, young upland birds. It, it, there should be quite a few around. We'll see what happens with the with the spring if it if it. Uh, you know, we could certainly use some rain uh, with how dry yeah. the state has been, but I know if we get too much and too big of events that that has impacts to nesting birds as well and to uh, forage production, insects, and that sort of thing. So we'll have to see how this year progresses. Well, and that you make a good segue that we could definitely use some rain. Next week, uh, episode 155, we're talking about planning and preparing for wildfire season. Uh, it's been super dry this spring. We've already had a couple, there's a big one down in Texas. We had one down in, is it was Waseca area? I think last weekend, a wildfire, grass fire down there. So use caution when you're out there. We're gonna be talking about that next week, how landowners can, uh, better prepare their property and how you can be prepared for wildfire season. So Scott, as always, fantastic job today. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your insight into getting kids outdoors. Um, just reiterate that you'll never have a bad time taking a kid outdoors. It's always, it's always fun and it's always time well spent. So thanks everyone. Uh, thank you again, thank you. Scott, and we'll see everybody next week, hopefully. Sounds good. Enjoy those turkey hunts. <laughs>